Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Community Bible Study. I'm hanging out by my Christmas tree here this morning because this is our last lesson before Christmas. We won't meet again until 2020 is over, and I think that a lot of us will not be so sad to see it gone. Before we start, let me just wish you a very Merry Christmas. Uh, that may not seem so possible for some of us right now, but maybe this Christmas, more than ever before, we will hold on more tightly, more passionately, more affectionately to the reality that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Maybe in the past, some of the externals of Christmas have gotten a little bit in the way of our cherishing that most precious reality, Emmanuel, God with us. We are not alone, even if it may feel like that right now. With fewer distractions this time, I pray that he will be nearer to you this Christmas than ever before. And as much as I am missing being together in person, probably more now than ever since March, I'm missing seeing all your sweet children act out the Christmas pageant on Wednesday morning. But I can't think of many other passages of scripture that would be more fitting to talk about right before Christmas than this one. Please open your Bibles to John chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 37 through 39. J.C. Ryle said that some scripture passages should be written in gold, and this is one of them. Let's pray before we read. Father, we ask that you would bless the hearing, the reading of your word. That you would work in us through Christ's words. That you would change us. That you would draw us ever more close. That those who don't know you will come, will answer his call, come and believe and drink the water that he offers. Fill us, O oh Lord, with those gracious living waters, with the rivers of water that are inexhaustible. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Where would we be without it? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet, the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not been glorified. Amen. I want to spend just a few minutes explaining a little bit of the background of what's happening here in chapter 7, so that we get a more vivid picture of just how incredible this moment really was. In fact, it's entirely possible that aside from Christ's suffering on the cross, this may be the most important moment of his life. Just to give you a sense of the timeline that we're looking at here, chapter seven occurs about six months after the miracle in chapter six, the feeding of the 5,000, uh, and six months before his crucifixion. So it's autumn time now, 
and the Feast of Booze, or as it's sometimes called, the Feast of Tabernacles, was about to take place. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that feast and what it signified. According to the ancient historian Josephus, it was the most popular of the three main Jewish, Jewish feasts, and thousands of people came and flocked to Jerusalem. It was a celebration of the harvest, the harvest of grapes and olives, not grain. Grain happened in the springtime. Of any of our holidays, if you're trying to relate one to our traditions, it's probably most like our Thanksgiving. Uh, it was more than that though. It was a celebration of harvest for sure, but it was also a memorial of their time in the desert wilderness when they lived in temporary housing, in tents, before they were established in the land of promise. Uh, while they were wandering around in the desert, they depended on God for his physical guidance. He led them in the form of a pillar of cloud and fire for 40 long years as they made their way to the promised land. During that time, as you know, the Lord's presence dwelt in the tabernacle, uh, the sanctuary that God himself designed, and then instructed the Israelites to place it right in the center of the Jewish camp with three tribes of Israel camped around on every side, three on the north, three on the south, three in the east and the west, so that his presence was central to his people. He placed himself quite literally right in the middle of where the people lived. Praise God for that. Praise God for his foresight and wisdom and brilliance and love. Not only does he want to be central to, to his own people, because love always wants to be with its beloved, but he also knows that we need him to be right in the center of us. We need him central. We need him right here, close and intimate. The Feast of Booths occurred during uh, the Jewish month Tishri, which would be September, October, and it was on the 15th to the 21st day of that month, lasted seven days with a particular special assembly that was given with lots of pomp and circumstance on the last day. To commemorate their time as pilgrims, wanderers, the Jewish people would make, would build rather makeshift structures out of branches and leaves to live in for the week. Uh, some people would put those structures on the roofs of their houses, some in their courtyard. They were just all over the area during the Feast of Booths. Uh, and there were some particular specifications that were important. For example, you had to be able to see through the branches, through the leaves, um, see little pockets, glimpses of the sky so that you could see the stars at night, just like the Israelites did when they were wandering around in the wilderness. There was considerable pageantry during this festival. There were uh, two particular rituals. One was a water drawing ritual and the other was a lamp lighting ritual. I wanna talk about the water one today because that connects with what Jesus had to say in verses 37 and 38. So here's what happened. On each of the seven feast days, a priest would fill a golden pitcher with water from the pool of Siloam. And then accompanied by a solemn procession led by the high priest, uh, he would return to the temple. And as the procession approached the water gate on the south side of the inner court, Three blasts from the shofar were sounded, shofar were sounded. 
the priests would process around the altar with the golden flagon and the temple choir would sing the halal, which is Psalm 113 through 118. And when the choir reached Psalm 118, every man would sh sh shake a uh, lulab uh, in his right hand, which is a combination of, of branches. It's a myrtle branch, a willow twig tied together with, with a palm leaf. Uh, and he would hold it in his right hand and shake it. And in his left hand, he would raise a piece of citrus fruit, an orange maybe, as a sign of the gathered harvest. And then they would all cry out together, give thanks to the Lord three times. And with the sound of the trumpets and the shouts of the rejoicing crowd, the priest would walk around the altar. And on the final day of the feast, he would walk around the altar seven times, commemorating walking around Jericho seven times before the Lord caused the wall of that great city to fall. Then the priest would pour out the water onto the altar, pour it out before the Lord. People were jovial. This was a happy occasion. They referred to it actually as their season of our, the season of our gladness. They rejoiced and remembered God's goodness to them in the desert, God providing water from a rock. You probably recall that there were two times in the Old Testament when Moses struck a water, uh, a rock rather, and water sprung out. The first time was in Exodus 17. The people were really thirsty and bitterly complaining. I imagine being thirsty in the desert is a thirsty that I've never experienced. The Lord instructed Moses to strike the rock and water gushed out. You see, that rock represented Christ, the Word who became flesh, the eternal water source, our rock and our Redeemer. The second time was in Numbers chapter 20. And this time the Lord told Moses to speak to the rock, not strike it, for it had already been struck. But Moses, in anger, struck the rock twice. Water still came out. The Lord still provided for the people, but Moses paid dearly for his disobedience because he had tainted the picture of Jesus Christ. That rock was to represent Christ, struck once, not twice. Jesus was crucified once to pay for every sin we would ever commit, but struck only once. Moses was to hit the rock only once to point to the fact that Jesus suffered once, died once. And then after that, Moses was to speak to the rock. Speak to the rock who provides water to quench our thirst. Jesus suffered once for us so that we can now talk to him. We can speak to the rock that is our redeemer and savior and friend. He's not to be struck again because he suffered once for all. We can speak to him through the power of the Holy Spirit, the water of life that he provides. So this ceremony of the Feast of Booths looked back to God's goodness, goodness rather, but it would also look forward to the bounties of the Messianic age as well. Their minds would have gone to Isaiah 12, 3. Therefore, with joy, you shall draw water from the wells of salvation. This was like a historical pageant uh, with a big history lesson all wrapped into one. 
Don Carson, in his book, The Gospel According to John, said this, quote, These ceremonies of the Feast of Tabernacles were related to Jewish thought, both to the Lord's provision of water in the desert and to the Lord's pouring out of the Spirit in the last days. Pouring at the Feast of Tabernacles refers symbolically to the Messianic Age, in which a stream from the sacred rock would flow over the whole earth, end quote. A stream from the sacred rock pouring out water and pouring out the spirit. Jesus pouring out water in the spirit. He is our rock and our redeemer. I want to help you envision a bit of what actually took place during this feast so that we could better understand the context in which Jesus speaks in verses 37 and 38. And, by the way, he doesn't simply speak. He cries out according to verse 37. And you see how brilliantly he uses all this ceremony and pageantry, all that has been going on, you see the brilliant use of his timing. His timing is always perfect. Just like in the beginning of the chapter when his brothers try to convince him to go to the feast, but he was not ready to go. He would not be pressured by their agenda because his timing is impeccable. So with the pouring out of the water on everyone's mind and all that that signifies, with this history lesson of God's goodness going on before their very eyes, for all of it was a gigantic object lesson pointing directly to Jesus Christ. At this perfect moment, Jesus cries out. He's not speaking softly to those around him. He's yelling. He cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has set, have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He's basically saying, they're talking about me. You know, when the Samaritan woman says, give me this living water so that I don't have to come back here to this well, Jesus says to her, I'm the giver of the water of life. When Jesus describes the bread of life to those who had been miraculously um, fed, and they say to him, give us this bread, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. When Jesus tells his disciples that he goes to prepare a place for them because he's going to the cross to die for them, and he says in John 14, 3, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And Thomas says to him, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. Jesus says back, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus fulfills the meaning of the Feast of Booths. He is the fulfillment of all that it was and all that it anticipated. The Bible is one long object lesson after another, pointing directly to the person of Jesus Christ. Isaiah invited the thirsty to drink from the waters in Isaiah 55, 1. Jesus announces that he is the one who can provide the water. It is through him that we have access to the Spirit. Notice that in verse 39 of chapter 7, he says, it says, the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. 
Jesus was lifted up and glorified on the cross and in his resurrection and ascension to the Father, his path to glorification was the cross. Without the cross, we would have nothing. We would not have the Spirit. There would be no forgiveness of sins, no inheritance in heaven, no peace, no knowledge of God and his glorious grace, no love for him, no wisdom, no fruit of the Spirit, no love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control because we wouldn't have the Spirit. Do you see what an incredible Christmas gift we have been given? We have everything. Even if we have nothing that the world values, we have everything. This is the very same message he gave to the Samaritan woman in chapter 4. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. There are several Old Testament passages that connect water with the end time gift of the Holy Spirit. One of them is Isaiah 44, 3. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing upon your descendants. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. From all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will, I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. Isaiah 58, 11, And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. Jesus is saying, drink the water that I give. Believe in me and I will give you the Holy Spirit. It's interesting to think about the way Jesus describes the water he gives. It's a spring, a river. It's own source of water. It's not a lake. It's moving. It has current. It's flowing. It's a powerful, inexhaustible source of water. It becomes its own body. It's not a source that can ever be exhausted because he's talking about his very own spirit, the spirit of the living God. He can and he will dwell within you if you believe in the Son. If we desire his will, as Jesus says in verse 17, he will dwell within us. It's amazing that God's presence with his people has grown increasingly intimate throughout salvation history. He began by dwelling within the midst of an Israelite camp in the tabernacle. And then the word, his own son, part of his own Godhead, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. A lot of people have seen his miracles, but not everyone saw his glory. At the wedding in Canaan, in Cana, 
The servants saw his miracle, but the disciples saw his glory. In the feeding of the 5,000, maybe up to 20,000 people saw his miracle, but far fewer saw his glory. Moses pleaded with the Lord in Exodus 33 and asked him to show him his glory. And the Lord said, I will hide you in the cleft of a rock and I will cover you with my hand and I will allow my goodness to pass before you. God's goodness is never more demonstrated than on the cross of Jesus Christ. His goodness has passed before us and we have seen his glory. For those of us who believe, who have seen his glory with our spiritual eyes, the presence of the Lord dwells within us, not just in a tabernacle and not even in a person, but within us. We are now the new tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, of the living God. It's unbelievable that he dwells so close, so intimately. And he is like a spring, a river of water, an inexhaustible supply of love and power all of the time. And he is right here. If anyone thirsts, Jesus says, let him come to me and drink. The invitation of the gospel, of the entire Bible really, is to come. Come and you will see. Come and see. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. The final chapter of the last book of this great Bible gives us a glorious picture. Revelation 22, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. You heard that. Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. Revelation 22, 17, some of the very last words of the Bible says this, the spirit and the bride say come and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. As Charles Spurgeon says, come is a gentle word. The law is filled with harsh words like strive and work and try. And if you fail, you perish. But the sweet invitation of Christ is come. The law puts fear in the hearts of people, always dangling a carrot in front of you that you can't quite attain. But the gospel attracts and draws us with 
the tender love of the Good Shepherd, the water giver, with a soft word, come, with a loving word. Charles Spurgeon said this, from the first moment of your spiritual life until you are ushered into glory, the language of Christ to you will be come. Come unto me. As a mother puts out her little finger to her little child and woos her to walk by saying, come, even so does Jesus. He will always be ahead of you, bidding you follow him as the soldier follows his captain. He will always go before you to pave your way and clear your path and you shall hear his animating voice calling you after him all through your life. While in the solemn hour of death, his sweet words with which he shall usher you into the heavenly world shall be, come ye blessed of my father, end quote. You know, that is also our cry to him. Come, come Lord Jesus. We long for his appearing, appearing for his second advent. Come quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus. We are longing, thirsting for a nearer walk with him, for a closer communion with him. His word to us is come. And our response to him is the same. Come, come Lord and abide with us. Come and occupy the throne of my heart. If you have never fully entrusted your life to the son who gave his life for you, please don't let this moment pass by. Come to him. Humble yourself before him and pray, believe in him. And out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. Hear the final words of Christ to us from Revelation 22, 20. Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the Lord give you a blessed Christmas this year with him. It's better than just a merry one. Till next time.